This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Heart and Vascular Grand Rounds. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Bill Nicholson, who joined us at Emory in uh, April of this year. Um, Bill is the System Director of Complex Coronary and Cardiac Intervention, and he's also the Director of Complex High-Risk Interventional Procedures Fellowship, the CHIP program. And he's also the Director of uh, Interventional Cardiology per our email just last week, I believe. Um, he completed his medical school at Penn State College of Medicine and residency and chief medicine uh, residency at um, the Brown University. He was a cardiology fellow here and an interventional um, fellow here as well. Uh, then he moved to York uh, to join his father in practice and developed the coronary um, and structural heart program with a focus on CTOs. Um, and he's uh, he made a uh, I was reading um, his bio and York became the top five CTO centers, which is pretty amazing uh, with 250 uh, cases per year. Um, and Bill has been, um, uh, has done about 2,500 CTOs. Uh, he's hosted over a hundred training courses and has been invited um, guest operator at national and international conferences. He enjoys teaching and research. And one thing I know about Bill is um, actually when I was a resident, uh, this is one of my favorite stories just because uh, it's what I remember about Bill and his work ethic uh, from here. I was a resident here and um, it was a particularly busy night on cardiology uh, rotation, which it always was uh, at EUH. And so I was working up my eighth admission, the attending had called me and I was you know, we used to have to fill out those H and P forms back then, um, and uh, I was getting ready to do it. And in comes in Bill Nicholson to the CCU and says, "I've already done the H and P. It's here." I was like, "Wow, a fellow did the H and P for me <laughs> at like 3 a.m." So I, I'll, Bill, got points for that, and I've never forgotten that. Um, so with that intro, I'm going to turn it over to Bill uh, to talk to us about contemporary complex uh, PCI. Thanks, Pooja. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, to speak today, and you know, nothing but fond memories of our time back together back when uh, when I was a fellow. And so it's nice to be back. Uh, it's really been a privilege to come back uh, to a place that's very special to me. So you know, I think that uh, I'm excited about the opportunity to be here. Uh, I've really enjoyed uh, everybody that I've gotten a chance to work with coming back, and really enjoyed the fellows, and uh, look forward to, to hopefully a long time here, uh, having a good time with the. Uh, uh, coronary uh, complex revascularization program. So I was going to talk about where we are today a little bit with where we are with complex uh, revascularization strategies and uh, I'm going to focus a little bit uh, on what we've changed uh, in interventional cardiology from a PCI perspective that I think has made us better operators, uh, maybe expanded where we have a role for uh, treating some of the complex disease, where we fit in with the uh, surgical uh, options and arena, uh, where we fit in a little bit with the medical therapy arena and then uh, where I think things are going uh, from that direction. And so uh, I've got quite a bit we can go through um, and uh, we'll, we'll make sure that we finish on time. Uh, I'll try to stop uh, about 8.15 so that there's some time for questions. Um, I thought maybe some of this would be most interesting to do uh, a little bit case-based. Uh, saw some of uh, Dr. King, I think Dr. Douglas are on the call and uh, you know, Emory's obviously the birthplace and the epicenter of, uh, of uh, PCI uh, with uh, uh, their pioneering work with Dr. Grunzig back in the early 80s. Um, and so the first case is actually kind of an interesting case because he's a 78 year old gentleman who came here in his 40s. Uh, uh, he had an attempted PCI of his LAD. Uh, you know, these people are from North Georgia and I think have a little bit of limited understanding. They, they explained to us how the balloon was on a fixed wire catheter and, and that they couldn't get it through the lesion. Uh, and uh, they aborted the procedure, uh, and uh, he went back uh, to North Georgia, went on warfarin therapy uh, without any follow-up INRs and any follow-up uh, physician appointments for 36 years. So there's a t the, the optimal medical therapy apparently lasted for 36 years, and so uh, had a worsening angina of symptoms. Uh, his daughter's very well versed. Uh, had read about a bunch about uh, some advancements in. Uh, uh, treatment options and brought him back uh, for a repeat heart cath to the escalating symptoms over the uh, two years leading into this. I, I'd, I'd like to talk 
during this is, you know, really what we've changed in our PCI strategies that I think has made us a, a better option than what we maybe were before uh, for some of these complex lesions. Uh, and that uh, has a series of different things that we do differently now uh, that I think are regular uh, portions of, of our uh, revascularization strategies from a PCI perspective. And then uh, we can take some brief questions about uh, some high bleeding risk criteria. You know, I think our dual antiplatelet therapy requirements have uh, changed dramatically. Uh, and, you know, talk a little bit about bare metal stents versus drug eluting stents. And uh, I think bare metal stents are really something of antiquity. We don't really, I don't even think we have them on the shelf anymore. I haven't put one in in over five years. So four years, I guess. So, but uh, uh, we can talk about all that as we move along. I thought this would be most interesting to kind of look at this from a case-based perspective. This is that gentleman, uh, you know, they, they had attempted to do his LAD uh, back in uh, the 80s. You know, obviously equipment was pretty rudimentary back then and, and the procedure was entirely different than what we have uh, today. And what we can do uh, is remarkably uh, change, but you can see very complex circumflex disease. Uh, he's got uh, you know, AV group circumflex and heavy lesion. Uh, and also has both uh, the first uh, marginal bifurcates has a small limb that has a almost a total occlusion, uh, but has a really calcified and, and heavily diseased uh, upper limb. The right uh, is not a whole lot better. The right has a tight lesion proximally that's calcified. You can see he's got these mature collaterals going over and filling in uh, the LAD. And so very complex disease. Uh, when we try to score these, I think it's important that we start to look at these a little bit more objectively than maybe what we've done in the past. Uh, at, at different uh, programs, you know, the ejection fraction we thought was about 40% with some uh, anterior lateral hypokinesis. Um, I think when you get into the discussion of, you know, is he a revascularization candidate or, or medical therapy candidate, I think that's a whole different discussion. Obviously, he doesn't really fit into the ischemia trial. He's not a stable angina patient. Uh, you know, in the ischemia trial, that's who we had. Uh, you know, and keep in mind, remember that a third of those patients in ischemia didn't have any angina at all. So, you know, you're talking about uh, almost another third had angina you know, once or twice a month. So, you know, you're talking about very uh, low uh, symptomatic patients. So that's not who we're really looking at here. This is somebody with escalating symptoms, very complex disease. Uh, he would put, fit into this uh, category uh, of uh, triple vessel disease uh, with a high syntax score. Now, we calculate syntax scores on these patients. Uh, and when you do that, you know, you factor in each of the different lesions that the patient has and you get a total score. Uh, this score for people that aren't familiar, you know, it sort of breaks into tertiles where there's a zero to 22, which is kind of the low risk group or low complexity group. 22 to 33 is kind of an intermediate complexity group and above 33 is a high complexity group. And this is what translates. So over the years, you know, as the complexity of this got higher and higher, uh, the uh, inferiority of uh, PCI to uh, surgery uh, became more apparent. And, and uh, we have gone into a, a syntax two score that actually factors in some clinical criteria, such as the patient's age, creatinine, ejection fraction, left main disease was not part of syntax. So it's always a no for left main disease in the syntax two score. Uh, gender, COPD, and, and peripheral vascular disease. In interestingly enough, for anybody, you know, all the Freedom Trial uh, fans and so forth, the diabetes does not factor into this, but uh, you get this rate or, or percentage based upon uh, the retrospective uh, matching it to uh, the data uh, from syntax. And you can see that the, the four year mortality uh, for PCI is 23% versus cabbage is, is 12%. And so cabbage would be recommended in this patient. So if you look at that, you know, this is why that breaks out that way. Uh, if you look at the low syntax score patients, you know, you have, uh, you know, no significant difference between uh, PCI versus cabbage in that group. You start to see a difference uh, as you get into the intermediate syntax. And when you get into the high syntax score, you clearly see a difference. And that's both in, in death and MI are the two main driving uh, factors all, along with the uh, repeat revascularization. And so, so I think through the years, we've kind of come to the understanding that as the complexity gets higher, you know, the, the, the need for uh, surgery versus uh, stenting becomes more apparent. And that's really due to the fact that, uh, that the benefits of complete revascularization. And this is where we fall short uh, in PCI as compared to surgery, historically at least. And so if you look at uh, the death or MI rates uh, as you have residual ischemia, and this is from the COURAGE trial. So again, from a medical uh, therapy, a uh, very positive trial. As you get a larger and larger area of ischemic burden uh, present, so if you get to up to 5%, uh, you see uh, up to a 15% uh, increase in death or MI uh, with medical therapy versus the residual ischemia. 
And as you climb that residual ischemia to greater than 10% uh, over this four year period, you had a 40% increase uh, risk of uh, death or MI uh, in that group. So complete revascularization is important. When we talk about that, when I showed you that syntax score, uh, the goal of complete revascularization is obviously to get the syntax score down to zero if you can, but what we consider complete and incomplete revascularization is a residual syntax score of eight or less. And so if you can get the syntax score down to under eight, we consider that to be complete revascularization. And if you look at how that translates to a lot of different things in, in cardiology and some things that we know are important for predictors and, and survival, uh, it clearly translates to an improved uh, ejection fraction. If you can achieve complete revascularization, there's multiple studies that have shown uh, that your follow-up uh, uh, ejection fraction assessment uh, improves uh, in, in, in each of those groups when you achieve it as compared to when you don't. Um, when you look at those patients and you talk about, you know, these are four-year follow-up studies where people are looking at uh, MIs and, and uh, cardiac death, uh, part of that is the fact that these patients can undergo other procedures, undergo other stressors during this period of time. Uh, and if you look at the risk of uh, perioperative, uh, both the uh, uh, MI and MACE, uh, as you have more and more territories unrevascularized, uh, your risk of having uh, an event uh, periprocedurally goes up uh, as you have that. We do have some data uh, looking at complete revascularization versus incomplete revascularization when people come in with, uh, with uh, unstable angina uh, and they have a MI, they get uh, treated and, and have their culprit lesion treated only versus uh, in the a uh, complete trial they went on to have uh, both the uh, culprit lesion and the non-culprit lesions treated. And you can see there's statistically significantly a difference um, at five years uh, between the two groups uh, as far as uh, having um, a cumulative incidence of, uh, of a new MI or cardiac death. And the interesting thing when you look at this is that I think where we kind of lose sight of things, and this is where I think uh, the, the world is changing, is I think we both do a poor job of complete revascularization. So it's not just limited to PCI. When you break down these more complex cases and you go from low to intermediate and high risk syntax scores and increase the complexity of these cases, if you look at the, 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 the frequency of how frequently we achieve complete revascularization or how, how frequently do we get that syntax score down to under eight, you know, we only get it down there about a, you know, two thirds of the time in even the lowest risk patients with PCI. But you can see we're not far from where uh, our, our surgical colleagues are at the same stage. You can see that this delta, this gap tends to get bigger as the complexity gets higher. Uh, so they do do a better job uh, than us, to, uh, historically at least, um, with the more complex cases where we've sort of fall short. And the reason why we fall short with this uh, <clears throat> is largely due to the presence of uh, uh, chronic total occlusions. And for uh, anybody that's not completely familiar, chronic total occlusion just means the vessel's been completely closed uh, for at least three months. And, and uh, you know, these territories often develop uh, collateral filling from uh, other donor vessels uh, and uh, are often viable, often, uh, uh, you know, uh, territories that will contribute uh, uh, if you're allowed, uh, if you can revascularize them. But uh, they're very common. Uh, you know, when you get into multivessel disease, almost 20% of patients with multivessel disease will have uh, a CTO. Uh, it's traditionally been the number one reason why people send people for bypass surgery is the presence of a CTO. Everybody talks about diabetes, left main, low EF, triple vessel disease. The number one reason, if you look at data uh, or look at uh, historically, uh, the number one uh, indicator for uh, going to surgery uh, is the presence of a CTO. Uh, and I think if you look at that, one of the disturbing portions of that is if you're sending people for surgery because of the CTO, if you go back and look at syntax and you look at the 270 so patients almost that had a, a CTO, um, almost a third of those patients went to the operating room and didn't get a bypass put on the CTO. And, and that happens not infrequently where it's felt to be a poor target, it's too small, uh, they can't get to, to the actual territory that they can revascularize. And so, so you send these people for surgery and a third of them don't go on to get a conduit put on the, put on the uh, vessel that you wanted to have operated on in the first place. And then when you go and look at other data that looks at this too, if you put a vein graft on a CTO, you know, the LED is a different animal altogether. The LED has a different runoff and, and you can put a lemma on the LED, but you can also put a vein on the LED uh, and the patency rates of a vein on the LED are still extremely high. But if you get in the circumflex and right coronary artery lesions and you put a vein graft on a CTO of the right or CTO of the circumflex, the patency rates less than 25% of the year of that vein being open. So, 
75% of those patients, so first of all, you send them to surgery, only a third of them, a third of them didn't get a graft, so 67% did, and of those 67%, 75%, uh, are going to have occluded. So in about a year's time, only about 20% of your non-LAD CTOs are still going to have a working bypass graft. And you can juxtapose that to uh, across Cypher, which is an old uh, uh, CTO trial went on when I was a fellow here. Dr. Douglas was one of the uh, PIs on that. And, uh, you know, we had about 90 to 91% patency rates of uh, stents to the CTO segment at one year with angiographic follow-up, not just clinical angiographic. Uh, and uh, complex long lesions. So you, so you have an ability to have a durable result PCI-wise uh, and, and a predictable result, at least in a year's time, uh, comparatively to surgery. Uh, and the, the, the problem with this is, is that we've had poor success rates with opening up CTOs through the years. And, and I'll show you a little bit of data to go along with that. This is where I think we've kind of come into the modern era of how PCI should really be performed. And so this looked at state-of-the-art uh, PCI techniques. And, and so Syntax is an, is an older trial. You know, you're over 10 years old at this point in time, obviously done with a previous generation uh, drug eluting stent, but more importantly, previous uh, strategies for revascularization. And what they did with Syntax 2, uh, and, and I think this is important to understand, um, this is a, a single arm uh, trial where they took patients with three vessel disease uh, and they put them into that syntax calculator that I showed you earlier. Uh, and at the end, when you put in all their different criteria as far as their um, age and, and, and creatinine and, and ejection fraction and so forth that I showed you, it spits out uh, a decision about either cabbage or PCI. And so they considered uh, equipoise uh, at four years to be that uh, either one was an option. So if you decided that the patient could either have surgery or PCI, both were viable options. Uh, those were the patients they were looking for uh, in, in the modern uh, Syntax 2 trial to be able to follow those patients and then compare them back to the Syntax 1 group. And so, so they found 450 patients uh, that they um, uh, went on to look at uh, that, that they felt uh, were equal to go to either surgery or PCI, uh, and those are the patients that they enrolled. They did use a modern uh, day stent, just so everybody's on the same page. The stents have gotten smaller uh, with, with uh, strut thickness. Uh, it has gotten less. Uh, they've obviously gotten uh, coated with uh, polymers. Uh, some of them have, have aluminum polymers where they're just on the uh, inside of the stent, so they're only exposing uh, the, the actual lumen. Some are reabsorbable, some are not. The stents have gotten remarkably good and remarkably safe. And so I think you're going to see less and less uh, iterative uh, improvements on uh, stent uh, platforms just because they've gotten so good. And I think the return on investment for the companies is so low that I think you're sort of looking at what we've got. Uh, but they are remarkably good, remarkably safe at this point in time. And so I think the changes that we're seeing uh, with outcomes uh, and, and really with even to the point of, of DAP where people are not necessarily going to be on doing antiplatelet therapy nearly as long are probably related largely to stents, but uh, even more so, I think it's the techniques that's changed. And I think that that's why the stents have become safer is because I think uh, as a community, we're becoming better and better uh, with PCI. And so the big driving factors that I think make modern PCI different than what it's been in the past is I think you, you do need this understanding of the complexity of what you're dealing with. I do think you need to have a, a, a real discussion uh, from a heart team perspective and, and not just the kind of discussion that says, hey, take a look at this patient and then if they're a surgical candidate, they just disappear. I'm talking about having a real discussion where they, uh, both the CT surgeon and the interventional cardiologist kind of put forward what they can offer the patient, talk about it anatomically, review the films, review the clinical scenario and make a, a, a group decision uh, rather than just uh, deferring to one another on, on different things. But that's done very well at Emory. I think the surgery here is, is remarkably good. It's very heterogeneous around the country. And I think, uh, you know, for people that have been in other places, see that, you know, I think it's good to understand that uh, what you guys see as commonplace here at Emory is not necessarily common uh, out in the real world for what uh, the surgeons can do. Um, I think a big portion of what we're changing is using functional assessment to drive our decision-making process. And this is IFR and FFR. Habib Samani has been one of the world leaders in this and I think really has uh, affected how we do things uh, uh, in modern PCI. And I'll show you some data that shows that. 
uh, implanting a modern stent obviously is a given. Uh, IVUS driven uh, implantation, I think, is mandatory. I think, you know, we used to IVUS uh, rarely, like five to 10% of the cases. Uh, I don't know how we did a good job without doing that. I don't know how you can size the vessel appropriately. I don't know how you can assess adequate stent expansion and adequate uh, um, uh, stent implantation without doing IVUS. Uh, and, uh, and then the last part is the ability to offer these patients complete revascularization. And I think our CTO expertise and ability to revascularize these patients has changed dramatically. And, and I think when you look at that, one of the di different things that they looked at with Simplex too. So when they went to do this study, there was almost 1600 lesions that they were planning on fixing. And uh, they didn't do functional assessment on everybody. The critical ones obviously got treated, but uh, they did do IFR on a significant portion of them, almost two thirds of them uh, ended, on to get, ended up getting functionally assessed. And if you can see with that, uh, when you get into this uh, low range uh, that, that sort of tells you that you shouldn't be treating, uh, I'm sorry, that you should be treating them when the IFR is low, uh, they went on to get treated. And when the IFR was high and they shouldn't be treated, the vast majority didn't get treated. And kind of in between is where we go on to FFR with uh, hyperemia and adenosine. Uh, to uh, to try, sort of assess this, but they ended up uh, deferring on a, on a significant number of lesions, and so uh, basically what they what they ended up with is you had a situation where uh, they ended up having uh, nearly uh, a third of the uh, lesions ended up being deferred on, and so if you look at that, you know you're talking about almost 1,600 lesions. And they really only went on to treat uh, about 1,200. And you know, so what does that mean? That means that if we decided that this 60% circumflex or so forth that somebody thought was significant really maybe wasn't significant. And so what did that do? That, that basically decreased the complexity of the syntax score because that lesion is no longer factored into a, a, a lesion that needs to be treated. But more importantly, it de <clears throat> decreased the number uh, of lesions being treated per patient. So the patient uh, went from a uh, having on average four lesions treated during a PCI down to 2.6. And so, uh, and th that translates to the fact that you have less, obviously, target vessel revascularization, you have less inappropriate stenting being done. And so they dramatically reduced the number of lesions that they needed to treat. They dramatically increased the amount of IVUS. If you look at old syntax scores, which is about 10 years old, only about 5% of those patients underwent IVUS. You know, about 85% in this group underwent IVUS. Uh, this is from uh, the, the study, Syntex2 was done by some of my good friends that are my European colleagues uh, who are fantastic operators and, and uh, really uh, physiologic and IVUS uh, driven. Uh, and you can see when they do IVUS and look at the study, look at the uh, result afterwards, almost a third of the time that resulted in them doing a post dilatation of the, of the uh, stent to better oppose the stent and to uh, better optimize the result. Um, and then this is not surprising either, but if you look at the CTO success rate, you know, from, from our studies here in the U.S. that we've been big participants in, the CTO success rate is right now around 89 or 90 percent that we can actually uh, open the lesion and end up with a, with a good result. Uh, and that's about where they were at uh, as well. Back with Syntax 1, only about 50 percent, and this still holds true to a lot of centers. Michigan uh, State Database just released their, I wrote an editorial on this, they, they, their still success rates are only in the low 50s, which is uh, uh, abysmal. Um, you know, you should be achieving, uh, you know, 85 to 90% success rates. And so, so if you look at what, what, what was being done in this trial, it's different is we're using physiology to drive us. So we're picking the lesions that do need to be fixed and not the ones that we think that angiographically or visually need to be fixed. We're able to fix the lesions. So even the ones that are CTOs, we're able to fix and offer the patients complete revascularization. And we're optimizing our stents by prepping the vessel with atherectomy and, and doing IVUS uh, both pre and post to make sure our stent apposition is size and is optimal. And so what that's translated to uh, is the fact that if you look at the three-year results of Syntax 2 versus Syntax 1, there's clearly an improvement with outcomes. And, and this is now four-year data. So this is important because the translation of where Syntax 1 sort of fell short was at the two to three-year mark. And so we're at the four years, you see clearly a statistically significant improvement uh, in outcomes when you look at patients' uh, uh, that uh, are going through this sort of optimal modern PCI strategy. This holds true across all the different uh, cohorts of, uh, or all the different uh, endpoints that we're talking about as far as all-cause death, MI, repeat revascularization, stroke is all decreased. Uh, stent thrombosis is remarkably low, you know, so we're looking at a better stent, but, but I think more importantly, better PCI. Uh, and, you know, stent thrombosis rates is exceptionally low at 0.9 uh, as opposed to almost four times that in the past. 
Interestingly, these lesions we deferred on. So of the, of the lesions that we said, hey, these don't need to be treated. Uh, if you look at that at, uh, at, uh, one, at two year and three year follow-up, this is remarkably good to see. And, and I think reassuring to us to use IFR or FFR uh, to make these decisions. But only three out of the 262 lesions at two years needed to be treated, which is remarkably good. And it was only six uh, at three years. So three at two years, six at three years, which is uh, incredibly reassuring that of the 250 you know, lesions uh, plus that we decided didn't need to be treated, that we thought might need to be treated angiographically, turns out with medical therapy do just fine. And, and that, that, that's very reassuring. And if you look at kind of the, the you know, sort of exploratory endpoint of comparing this uh, modern PCI strategy to the sort of uh, uh, syntax cabbage data that we've been competing against uh, for years, uh, we are very competitive with this. And so, you know, we, we've gotten ourselves, I think, to a point with, uh, with optimal stenting and complete revascularization that we've become uh, competitive with uh, our surgical colleagues. This translated across different uh, syntax scores. So the complexity didn't matter as you got the uh, complete revascularization achieved. Uh, the syntax score became irrelevant, uh, and it did not translate across diabetes either. Now, these are exploratory, so these aren't final results that you can take to the bank and, and, and use for an argument, I think, but it's good uh, data to understand. So go back to our patient here that had this complex disease. So, you know, this is a this guy had refused surgery 36 years ago, and he refused surgery again. Uh, and uh, so we went on, and we actually did this as a live case, which probably maybe sometimes you your ambition is a little better than your judgment, I guess, but uh, we, we did this on TV. And so we went ahead and fixed the uh, circumflex uh, uh, lesion, which uh, I think was not a real complex lesion. Ivis driven, uh, ended up with stents in the higher limb and the lower limb. Nice result. We did not uh, chase after this small branch on a syntax score that would uh, relate to a syntax score of about two. So just so you keep that in context, you can see the LED is still obviously completely occluded. Uh, we turned our attention to the right coronary artery. Now, this is all done in one sitting. Uh, we uh, wrote ablated the right coronary artery due to heavy calcification. So it's uh, become very commonplace. We wrote ablate quite a bit. And so I think this has changed our vessel preparation. I think uh, it has translated to, to results being better. A uh, nice result in the right coronary artery. Uh, and then we turned our attention to the LAD, uh, which is uh, obviously the total occlusion. You can see the little stump. Uh, of the LAD here, uh, it's going via collaterals from the, from the uh, right system. What we did is uh, we, we, with modern techniques, we're able to work our way down uh, into the LAD. You can see we've got a little wire down sitting through here. Now, if you look at this close up, you can see that that wire is outside uh, of, the, uh, of the target. So it's with the vessel, but it's outside. So it's in a subentimal flap. This used to be kind of the end point for us or the struggling point where we try to get this wire back in through different wires, sharper wires. We've got modern techniques now that allow us to, to re-enter the true lumen predictably. So we somewhere in here, we went true lumen to false lumen and we're sitting in the false lumen. We just need to get back into true lumen and we can stent that whole segment. Uh, and what we do is we use a little microcatheter called a stingray catheter. And this is a small balloon we put in the subintimal space. It has a couple exit ports uh, that allow us to sit in the subintimal space. And we're able to uh, go interrogate those ports. I'll show you a, a second picture to make that a little clearer. So this balloon uh, is sitting in the subintimal space. <clears throat> pull this forward for you. We inflate the balloon. It kind of hugs the vessel like that, or ideally it would. And then we've got two exit ports that you see sitting here. So there's one exit port here and one here. One port's going to go up and one port's going to come down back into the true lumen. Uh, it's not predictable which one's which, but we just need to figure out which one that is. So we bring a little wire down. You can probe one port and you can see that's the wrong port. And so that's not the one you want to go out. Uh, there's no penalty if you do go out and you don't bleed or something like that. But so all you do is flip the wire around, come down and interrogate the other port and then you're able to punch back into the true lumen. And so, so you've basically gone from true lumen to false lumen to true lumen. And that's what's changed. And so this is sort of showing you we want to have our exit come out towards the vessel. And so you can see that's what we did here. So we bring a wire down. We can see that the, the true lumen is on the bottom side of the vessel here. Uh, you can see then we do our puncture. So you see the, the wire kind of move forward. And as it moves forward, the puncture goes into the true lumen. You'll see the wire progress downstream. So that's back into the true lumen. 
Uh, you can see now that we've got a wire sitting in the true lumen downstream sitting here. We're able to do our regular kind of PCI and stenting um, upstream uh, and end up with a very nice uh, result, uh, you know, and, and able to offer the patient, uh, you know, complete revascularization minus that small branch, uh, you know, with a, with a low residual syntax score uh, and uh, one day sitting took a little over two hours to do all this and he went home uh, the next morning. He's doing great uh, uh, up in Jenkinsville. So, so I think an example of what can be done with modern PCI, uh, people talk about all the time, can you stent the subintimal space? Does it matter? Uh, we have data now to support that, which I think is important. This is uh, from our European colleagues. I think it's probably one of the most important CTO uh, studies that we have that has angiographic follow-up on whether or not you went subintimal and stented the subintimal space or whether you stayed in the true lumen the whole time. And the fact of the matter with angiographic follow-up at, at two years, there's not a statistically significant difference between the two groups. Uh, and so it's been reassuring that, that this strategy has really kind of translated to our ability to do these more complex CTOs and, and having higher success rates uh, does not affect uh, durability, it appears. Show you two more cases just for interesting uh, sake. And then uh, we'll, we can take some questions if there are some. Uh, this is a good case. This is a you know, always trying to figure out your, your place in the world when you started a new center. And, you know, this is, a, I had started our TAVAR program back in Pennsylvania and don't have the volumes that, that, that you guys are doing amazing amounts of volumes down here with TAVAR. We, but I've done maybe 500 TAVARs or something and, and you know, get pretty comfortable with it. But this is the first TAVAR that somebody asked me to do since I came to Emory. And, you know, so just put you in your place. So this is a 95 year old. Uh, he came in with uh, exertional angina and I was thinking, my God, you're giving me a 95 year old for the first tavern. And then went and talked to the guy, you know, he got angina, he was pulling his boat out of the water when he was fishing. The guy's sharper than, than me and, and, and uh, you know, really entertaining guy, you know, came in with a, uh, escalating symptoms over the previous two weeks. Uh, had a troponin of 1.8, uh, really pretty healthy guy at 95. He's, he was on statin therapy and uh, minimal amount of uh, medications, but uh, was on amlodipine. Um, these are films from an outside hospital, but you can see uh, they had a hard time engaging the right, but you can see heavily calcified uh, osteoarthritic coronary artery disease. Um, the left system, uh, very complex anatomy is this aneurysm uh, that's right at the uh, bifurcation point uh, of the circumflex obtuse marginal. Uh, and then you can see we've also got uh, proximal LAD disease involvement uh, and mid LAD involvement. And so uh, to, to make things better, his ejection fraction was about 25 to 30% with some anterior apical uh, dyskinesis uh, and legitimate true aortic stenosis with over a four meter gradient with this poor ejection fraction. And so, so complex case, uh, you know, again, uh, if you look at uh, what we're looking at here, I mean, Surprisingly, I think it's one of the reasons why it's important to calculate syntax scores. People look at that anatomy and they think, oh, wow, that's super complex anatomy. It's really not, you know, so this is a syntax score of 20. This is in the lowest tertile of the three groups. And so I think it's important that you understand where that fits. And if you put them into the syntax two calculator, this is a patient that would be considered equipoise uh, for surgery versus uh, PCI. So, so I think it's, it's worthwhile doing those calculations. I think things that we think are complex or things that we've kind of have uh, beaten into us over the years of thinking are complex uh, really are not. And so I think uh, this is a, a worthwhile endeavor to do. I talked to the guy for quite a bit. The surgeons talked to him. The decision was that he wasn't a, a very good surgical candidate due to the complexity with his concomitant aortic stenosis and, and multivessel disease and obviously his advanced age. Uh, and so uh, that Wednesday after Memorial Day, I took him to the lab. Um, we uh, got single access uh, and uh, <clears throat> to uh, to do the uh, PCI and the, and the uh, valve. And so, so we crossed the valve. We did this TAVR with a 26 uh, millimeter uh, sapien three uh, valve with a nice result. Um, got a nice high sitting on the valve. We uh, we shoot for 90 10 at, at a minimum to try to be high. Uh, on the valve, uh, it doesn't usually affect your coronary access afterwards with the Edwards valve. It can sometimes with the with the the uh, core valve, but uh, with Evolute, we switched uh, our delivery system out for an impella due to the poor ejection fraction, knowing that we were going to have to rotoblade a good bit of this uh, calcified uh, coronary disease in order to uh, get him an optimal result. Uh, we did. We moved on. We rotobladed the right coronary artery, uh, stented the proximal right coronary artery, and got a very nice result there. Uh, turned our attention to the left system. 
Uh, you can see he's got this complex aneurysmal disease uh, in the circumflex. Uh, you can see our modern wires have gotten so good compared to what the guys have always had to use to in the past. You can see how that manages that uh, loop there in the uh, in the uh, aneurysmal segment, uh, and we're able to uh, wire downstream, uh, and, and it's just an advantage of modern equipment. Uh, we end up treating the circumflex, uh, which I think got a nice result, went across the aneurysmal segment, which really doesn't uh, translate to anything from a stent apposition perspective. Uh, it's not an issue. Uh, we went ahead with the LAD, which we rotobladed as well, uh, and then uh, stented back. Uh, um, that's just showing you the rotoblader, stented back into the left main. Um, optimized with uh, IVIS uh, and uh, got the patient a, a really nice result uh, with three vessel uh, revascularization and, and uh, valve replacement. Uh, in that case, was an hour and 45 minutes, and, uh, and at 95 years old, he went home the next morning. So, um, <clears throat> and uh, doing well. And so, so I think a remarkable case of showing what, what the modern uh, PCI is uh, capable of doing. Uh, and what we can offer patients at this point in time. This is a unique thing uh, to Emory to some degree, uh, and I think uh, really kind of highlights what I think is probably uh, where the world should be going. And, and I think uh, you guys are blessed here. Uh, Mike Halkos is a very, very good uh, um, robotic uh, IMA surgeon. Uh, you, your program here, I don't know how many people were here then, but when I was a fellow here, uh, Tom Vasiliadis had come here uh, and kind of pioneered a, a lot of the uh, uh, robotic uh, Lima to LAD uh, work. Uh, he was doing almost everything completely robotically. It's really kind of changed that most people are doing a mid cab now uh, where they take down the IMA uh, robotically and then they put a small kind of uh, keyhole incision uh, just uh, at the apex uh, and much similar to what we did when we were doing transapical TAVAR and they can get access uh, to the uh, to the anterior wall of the, of the part and get access to the LED and then they hand sew the Lima uh, to the LED uh, for the most part. Uh, these patients, uh, you know, with, with somebody who's really uh, slick with this, uh, the IMA takedown can take, you know, 20 to 30 minutes uh, and the whole procedure can, can usually be done in about an hour's time. Uh, we had a very uh, busy uh, robotic program uh, back in my previous institution. Uh, years ago, we lost our surgeon that, that did that, but uh, we were doing over about 100 to 115 of these a year. Uh, and you really have a, a great opportunity to offer the patient uh, what the, the surgeons have, you know, I think unquestionably the strongest uh, thing in their armamentarium. And I think the strongest thing for us to uh, compete effectively with, uh, and that's a limit to the LAD. And I think, you know, what, what our strategy used to be was that we would uh, bring patients into a complex disease or if you presented with left main disease or so forth, uh, the angiogram was done on day one. Uh, you got a lima to the LED robotically on day two. Uh, you got your uh, residual PCI done on day three uh, and uh, discharged either that day or the next day. And so you could get complete revascularization, I think, with the best of, of what both worlds are out there uh, to do that. And, and this is a case example uh, of that. Um, you know, this patient obviously has a, has a good ejection fraction. Uh, I was trained here, so I'm still stuck with the multi-purpose catheter. So all these are cases with a multi-purpose, but uh, um, you know, you can see the ejection fraction is normal. Uh, he's got this uh, fairly complex uh, CTO uh, of the right coronary artery. Uh, but again, with modern techniques, you know, we know that 90% of the time we can get this open. Uh, if we can't get it open and we bring them back for a second attempt, their success rate on the second attempt is 87%. So if you do that cumulatively, we have a you know uh, mid to high 90s uh, with with repeat uh, attempts. Uh, if you uh, aren't able to fix it on the first try, you're often able to modify it at least and give yourself a better uh, starting position on the second uh, attempt. You can see the LED disease here. Uh, you know there's some left main disease uh, distally. Uh, there's proximal and mid LED disease. Uh, the circumflex, uh, you know, it's a question of how people would have called that. I would have called that a 50 or 60 percent circumflex lesion. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, heterogeneity on how severe people think lesions are. And I think it's, as we showed with that earlier data, it's become less and less my job to tell you if it's significant based on my eyes and more my job to tell you if it's significant physiologically. And so we did IFR on this and, and the IFR uh, was uh, negative, meaning that it did not need to be treated. So, so really the patient has two vessel disease at this point in time. 
uh, has a, you know, sort of distal left main going into the LAD system. The circumflex uh, really wouldn't be included in this and has a CTO to the right. Now, if you look at that again, you know, if you look at a Sentai score, it's low, you know, so this falls into a, a Sentai score of 16. It's an equipoise group where PCR cabbage are, are both reasonable options, uh, but due to the, uh, you know, left main disease and and the patient is young at the age, uh, we, we elected to go with the robotic uh, Lima to the LAD, uh, which is a nice result here. So obviously there's no sternal wires here. So this was done uh, nicely with a nice uh, anastomosis, good flow distally. Went back and uh, treated the uh, CTO of the, of the uh, right coronary artery. Uh, one of the other techniques that's made us able to get these high 90% success rates on, on CTOs where traditionally, you know, the success rates were in the 50s is the ability to do retrograde uh, uh, PCI. So we basically go down the LAD and come through these septals or these connections and try to open the lesion uh, um, from the other side. Uh, you'll see that's what we've done here. So we took a wire and gone down backwards uh, and we're gonna bring our, our equipment all the way through and work on the back side of the lesion. Um, this is what Pratik and Lee are gonna stay on for an extra year and learn how to do during the next uh, year's time is these complex cases. Uh, and so we're able to uh, uh, work our way uh, backwards. You can see fighting through the blockage from the other direction. And we get to a point here where I'm gonna just jump ahead here, but you can see this is our retrograde wire and we're gonna take our retrograde wire and wire it through the lesion and into the anti-grade guide. And so now we've got the heart basically on a rope where you have uh, a wire going all the way through uh, the LAD coming down through the septal, going backwards through the lesion into the right and back out the other uh, access points. So obviously it requires two guides. We usually do one wrist, one groin, uh, but you've got the heart kind of on a rope at that point in time. Uh, but you're through the lesion. So you've, you've been true lumen, false lumen, true lumen. And so then we can switch around and we ended up rotablating this whole segment here. So again, you rotablate the whole way down through, kind of modify all the calcium so that it's going to be able to expand well so that you can get your stents to fully expand and then the IVUS for sizing uh, and then stent re-IVUS to make sure our stents are in well expanded and well opposed, which uh, we oftentimes do optimize uh, and get a nice result. And so so I think you have a nice example there with a with the hybrid approach where you end up with uh, both the, what, what the surgeons have to offer, which is the Lima to the LAD uh, with an optimal result. You have now a CTO PCI of the right coronary artery that we know with a vein graft is going to have very low durability rates at a year's time, maybe uh, about 25% patent vein grafts to this uh, at a year's time versus, you know, over 90% patency with the PCI results. So, so I think there's a lot of different things that have changed. I, I hope it's a, a good summary uh, of where we are with modern PCI. I think, you know, the, the limits as to what can be done in the PCI arena are, are basically uh, unlimited. I think we can fix virtually anything. It's just a question of what should we be fixing and what should our colleagues be fixing. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I think the, the goal uh, for these patients is complete revascularization. I think that's where we're seeing the differences between outcomes. I think that's where we see that our, our optimal uh, results. And then uh, I think with optimal PCI techniques and, and, and strategies that I've shown, uh, hopefully people understand and appreciate. Uh, and then that uh, should be used in, in uh, conjunction with our surgical options uh, from our surgical colleagues. And I think, you know, it's a team approach and, and I think there's a lot of uh, uh, good options that both sides have to offer. Uh, we can stop there and take questions. I think, you know, the, 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 we didn't talk much about DAPT and if people have questions about that, we can, we can answer that. But I think a, a short summary of DAPT right now is I think most of us have become very comfortable with uh, patients that are high bleeding risk patients. So patients that are older, patients that have uh, uh, concomitant uh, anticoagulation, patients with bleeding problems, low platelets, uh, expected surgery and so forth. Uh, really regardless of the complexity of those patients, uh, particularly if they're not ACS patients, so they're patients that were doing just uh, standard PCI on that didn't come in with a heart attack. Uh, I think almost all of us are comfortable at one month of uh, DAPT at this point in time. We've got multiple stents out there, multiple different uh, studies that have shown uh, the safety of that. And, and most frequently, starting out with uh, dual antiplatelet therapy with uh, PTY12 of your choice uh, and aspirin, and then uh, stopping the aspirin at one month. So. Pooja, I'll put it back to you. I, I think it gives us 10 or 15 minutes to talk about questions if there are any, uh, but uh, that's, that's what I had for today. Great, thank you so much. That was fantastic. I learned a lot and I love the cases. 
Um, we do have a question here that um, we'll start off with um, by uh, Larry Sperling. Um, do, do you want me to go ahead and read these or would you like to unmute and ask? I, I'm fine either way. If okay, I'll, either way. I'll go ahead and um, read it out here. Um, so he has two questions. Uh, one is, are there plans for an Orbita equivalent CTO trial? Uh, and the other one is referral for cardiac rehab. And is that part of the complex uh, PCI, you know, coronary artery treatment protocol, including pre-rehab? So optimal medical therapy prior to uh, CTO procedures. So I think, so the question about optimal medical therapy, that's what you asked, is there a role for optimal medical therapy for CTO PCI? And, and I think uh, that's absolute, you know, so I think, uh, uh, Larry, if, if I'm not answering the right question, just jump in and speak up. But, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, from, from my perspective, CTO PCI alone, you know, you, you, one, I think the ischemia trial, if anything, has shown us the fact that you, you, you need symptoms to really make a difference with what we're doing. And so for, for me, uh, the, things that I want to see with a CTO PCI, if I'm going to embark on a CTO PCI, is I need the patient to be symptomatic. I need them to be symptomatic despite uh, optimal medical therapy, meaning at least two anti antigenal agents that they'll tolerate it. And uh, if there's viability, so if there's motion in that wall, uh, you know, I think that, that that indicates viability. So if, uh, if I have wall motion on echo, if I have wall motion on MRI, uh, if I have a post PVC beat that shows, uh, you know, contractility in that territory, I'm comfortable with saying that the, the territory is viable. They're all ischemic. So, you know, they've done FFR on these lesions where they cross uh, CTOs and put an FFR wire in a distal bed and say, you know, are there enough collaterals to make this patient not ischemic? Has never been shown, okay? In multiple trials, they can't find one patient that has a non-ischemic territory. About 70% of them are ischemic at rest. Um, they're 100% ischemic with hyperemia, which explains why you see these patients with a fixed defect on their nuclear scans and they have wall motion in that territory. And you say, well, how can it be moving if it's dead? It's a, oftentimes a CTO territory. So it's just ischemic arrest and ischemic, more ischemic under stress. And so it's a fixed defect, uh, but they do have a viability in that territory. And then I think it, <coughs> excuse me, if you haven't, uh, uh, if you've gotten to the point where you've shown viability, you've tried to optimize your medical therapy and they still have symptoms, that's who you should be treating. CTO PCI is very complex, and, and I think you know you better have good indications to be doing it. Uh, the, the the mortality rate, which is you know, a lot, you know, is 0.9 percent. So you know if you do you know 500 of these, that's four to five deaths, and so that's that's a huge number, you know, from a complexity standpoint. And so I think when you're going to embark on those kind of complex cases, uh, you better have very very strong indications to be doing it. And so I've had a litany of patients that I've followed uh, in Pennsylvania that that, you know, had CTOs that clearly were doable, clearly were nice cases to go after, but, you know, just didn't have the symptoms to justify it. And, and uh, you know, I think this gentleman demonstrated from the 36 years in North Georgia with his CTO of his LAD, you, know, you can do okay with it. So I think uh, you, you really do need symptoms. As far as cardiac rehab, that's a standard part of, uh, of the discharge. You know, I think uh, there's, there's mortality benefit, you know, which is a shocking thing to say from cardiac rehab. The patients live longer if they do it. Uh, I think it's fantastic. Uh, you know, I have basically uh, have 100% of, uh, of my patients ought to be going uh, to cardiac rehab. So yeah, I, I believe strongly in both. Um, and what about the first question, which is uh, plans for an Orbita equivalent CTO trial? Yeah, so CTO, so CTO trials, so no, there's not plans, uh, but uh, you know, I think uh, um, what, what they've looked at, so, so there's a trial uh, called SHINE CTO that, that, that we were enrolled in at York and we're enrolling with uh, now here uh, at Emory, but this is a trial that's been in the works for years and, and has a hard time getting leverage. There's no support for it, so there's no uh, funding for it, uh, but, but SHINE CTO is supposed to be a sham trial, and, and so it's basically, and as you know, with, with sham trials, uh, I don't think there's ever been one that's proven to be positive. So I think, you know, you, the placebo effect and, and the benefit to the patient from that uh, is extraordinarily difficult to compete with. But the trial is designed uh, to have patients come in with a, a large uh, ischemic defect uh, on, on a demonstrated uh, on nuclear scan with uh, uh, symptoms despite medical therapy. And then they're going to be randomized to come in to have either a, a, a dual catheter, so double access uh, angiogram, uh, 
uh, and alone versus having a double access angiogram and fixing the, P the CTO PCI, the patient will be blinded to it. Uh, so the patient won't know whether or not they've had the CTO fixed or not. Uh, and then they're going to get, uh, you know, Seattle Angel uh, questions and functional testing uh, done at, uh, this, at three months and six months. And then they'll have the option to, uh, to uh, cross over at six months. So if you didn't have your CTO fixed or you didn't know whether or not you had it fixed, but you're still having symptoms, you're told at six months if you had them or didn't have them. And then you can uh, cross over and have the uh, other procedure done. It's a difficult trial to enroll in because, you know, you just don't have uh, funding to do it. Uh, Manus Berlakis is, is the head of it out of uh, Minneapolis Heart. We are part of it. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of getting uh, uh, things in order. Really, it would be a, a, a big trial to kind of predict one way or the other whether this is uh, the right thing to do. We have very compelling data uh, from OpenCTO, which was a, a, a registry, and people always sort of uh, uh, more or less don't like registries, but I think in, in reality, the way this registry was done is different. This took every, so it took theoretically whatever they considered to be the 10 kind of best or premier CTO operators in the country. Basically every patient that came through your lab for CTO PCI was enrolled. And so, so you didn't get the cherry pick. You didn't get to say, okay, this guy's got mild symptoms. I, you know, I'm not going to, you know, necessarily put him in shine CTO because I don't care if we fix it or don't fix it, but this guy's got a lot of symptoms. So we have to fix them. So you get all this selection bias that obviously goes into it that sort of gets beaten out in a, in a registry uh, that's all, all comers and all inclusive. Uh, and in that we had a thousand patients uh, that, that came through and uh, very uh, uh, rigorous uh, follow-up core lab. You know, this is not just a, a registry, very, very well done uh, and clearly have shown uh, functional and, and symptomatic uh, improvement uh, with, uh, with uh, CTO PCI. So so I don't think that the debate's out there whether or not uh, people improve. I don't think there's a debate out there whether or not um, people benefit from uh, CTO PCI anymore as far as uh, whether or not the symptoms improve. I think you go a long way to argue about whether or not it has any kind of uh, you know survival benefit. And I don't believe that it does. And, and I'm not uh, sold on it on a lot of different perspectives. But but, uh, you know, I think the need for that kind of randomized trials out there, it'd be nice if it happens and comes to fruition, but I have my doubts whether it'll ever get, uh, get completed. Thank you, Bill. Um, there's a question from uh, Andy Smith. Um, he has a question about viability. Um, go ahead, Dr. Smith. Yeah, Bill, so I, I guess in the uh, cardiac surgery trials that non-invasive testing for viability has not proven to be helpful overall. Um, and I guess a question related to CTO is at some point a CTO was an acute occlusion. Um, and what do we know about, what do we know about that? Like how many of these are associated with evidence of infarction versus not being and, and that type of thing. So um, they help me understand a little bit about how, what happens when something becomes a CTO. Yeah, I think uh, it's a good question. You know, so obviously every like what what Andy's referring to is every CTO was an acute occlusion at some point, uh, and you know I think it, it's really the question. So it's sort of two parts of what you're asking is one, you know, does viability matter? And, and you know we have some some data from the surgical trials and Stitch and things like that that show that maybe viability is not a predictor of uh, improved outcomes. Maybe patients do the same whether you revascularize a uh, quote unquote unviable territory versus, you know, viable, maybe there's a benefit from both. Um, we've, uh, not made that leap, but I think certainly it's there to, to, to generate some discussion. I think uh, along with your question, you know, the, the, the assessment of the viability, I don't know how, I, I don't think I can tell you why some people maintain viability and some people don't, uh, you know, I think that that's a, a ton of, uh, levels of, of research and, and understanding, um, of microvasculature and, and uh, things well beyond what we can talk about here. Um, but, uh, you know, I can tell you from assessment of viability, you know, from, from our perspective, you know, I think it is mandatory to, to be there and it's still sort of kind of the standard <coughs> with, uh, for us to, to go ahead with uh, CTO PCI. And I think, you know, clearly, you know, the 24 hour uh, thalliums are, are, are pretty weak. You know, I think if you don't want to do the CTO, that's a good one to get because it doesn't show viability very frequently. You know, so it's like, uh, if you don't want to do an intervention on somebody, get a stress echo because it'll turn out okay. And so, 
Um, but, you know, if you're really looking for viability, you know, cardiac MR uh, is kind of the gold standard along with PET. And I think both of those are, are very, very well done uh, locally here. And so um, hopefully that answers your question. I'm not sure I can understand why some people are viable and some people aren't, but, you know, it obviously has to do with the collaterals and, and uh, how well the, the distal bed uh, uh, withstands that initial insult. Uh, Bill, uh, I want to congratulate you on your new job. Uh, you're the fourth generation, and uh, so very proud to have you uh, back here running this show. Secondly, uh, thank you for showing the 36-year uh, outcome of our failed attempt. I don't know which <laughs> one of us did that, tried that case uh, in 1984, but- There's not a mid if that helps you. <laughs> <laughs> regardless of that, the, t the technology has improved so dramatically. These are, these are ph phenomenal uh, cases you're showing. But it, in your new job, it, it occurs to me that, that uh, there's gonna be a challenge for training. Uh, so the kind of cases you're showing and the title of what we call this now, CHIP, uh, sort of implies that that uh, the person going through interventional cardiology training is going to need a great deal of uh, experience in training and learning how to do all these things to achieve these kind of results. Are we going to divide up into people who do STEMI, kind of middle of the night, <laughs> interventional cardiologist, and, and other people who treat the complex stuff. This seems like a real challenge to figure out how, how to run training programs. Yeah, I think, uh, well, first of all, thanks for, for the nice comments. And, you know, it's an absolute privilege to be back and, and be in a position that, that I'm in. I think, you know, you guys have been, you know, I grew up knowing your guys' names when I was a kid from my dad spending his time here. And you guys are, are just... Uh, just absolute legends in the field and it's a privilege to be well, here. It's good, it's good to know that uh, real men and, and real women still use multi-purpose. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Explain that to some of our <laughs> other colleagues, yeah. so, which was your catheter, by the way, for people who didn't know that Dr. King uh, developed that catheter. So, um, I think your question about training is, is a very uh, pertinent and, and germane question to what we're going through right now. I think, you know, the Reminds me of when I was a fellow, I remember talking to uh, Bob Taylor and he was asking me what I liked and like, I like DP, I like uh, TE, I like uh, interventional. And he told me, you know, you got to pick something though. You can't do everything. And, and I think, you know, it's sort of in my mind is, is uh, equivalent to interventional cardiology at this point in time. I think it, it's from someone who really enjoyed structural heart. I really, I mean, I did mitral clip, I did TAVR, I did a ton of ASDs, PFOs. When I started out, I really enjoyed peripherals. I've probably done four or 500 carotid stents through the years and did a lot of SFA work and then, you know, got into the coronary complex uh, world too. You can't do it all. And, you know, and I think that, uh, well, you can do it all, but you can't do, very few people can do it all extremely well. And it's very hard to stay really uh, um, kind of cutting edge on all of them. And, and I think, I think your question's very spot on. I mean, I think that you're going to have to see a situation where you're probably going to have to have differentiation from the same idea when you had general cardiologists into all these different disciplines within cardiology. I think you're going to see the same thing in interventional where most people are going to go on and do structural training or most people are going to go on and do chip complex PCI training. I think some people will stay kind of in the general uh, arena. And I think you, you're going to have to, I think the training programs are going to change. I think you're going to see two-year training programs where you're going to do a general interventional year, and then you're going to differentiate after that year. I'd like to see it have uh, a lot of uh, crossover, you know, and in, in next year with the CHIP uh, structural program that we have here, you know, the, the, the CHIP fellows will do 10 months of CHIP and two months of structural, and the structural fellows will do 10 months of structural and two months of CHIP, which I think is great. You know, I think you, there's so much to be learned from large uh, alternative access, large bore access. I think there's important things for the structural people to learn about bailing yourself out with being able to do retrograde uh, access if a cusp uh, you know, occludes. And, and so I think, I think there's a lot of crossover, but I think it's gonna be uh, a, a bigger uh, world of differentiating uh, into subgroups uh, within interventional, fortunately or unfortunately. I mean, I, I like the idea of being involved in everything because I love interventional cardiology and every aspect that, that I've been involved with, but 
the reality is, you know, I can't be uh, a world-class you know, complex PCI CTO operator and a really world-class TAVR operator. I just can't. I mean, you know, and, and, and there's just not uh, the ability out there to do that. I think the bigger challenge, and this is what we've written a white paper on, is how do you do this for people that are not in training anymore? You know, and so the people that are five years out or four years out, you know, how does that person go on to, to acquire these kind of complex skill sets? And, and that that's a harder one. You know, I think, you know, when you have somebody for a year's time, you know, you can train them, but when you have somebody sort of busy practice and, and out there, how do you get that person in a, in a avenue or, or pathway to uh, accomplishing those skills? And so uh, it's going to be a change. You know, I think it is, uh, you've written on it a lot. And, and I think, you know, you've obviously been, you know, instrumental to, to the training of all this for years and years. And so, you know, I think uh, in my view, that's where I think it's probably going to have to go. I don't think that the, the one year, uh, uh, situation uh, is probably going to be something that, that lasts a whole lot longer. These are all questions uh, that need new answers. So glad you're yeah. working on it. No, it's a privilege again to be here. All right. If there are no other questions, um, does anybody else have any comments or questions? Um, we are past uh, 830. Um, okay then we'll go ahead and close. Um, happy holidays, everyone. And thanks again, uh, Bill. Thanks, Pooja. Appreciate it. You. Bye-bye. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.